minutes, but maybe he'll show up. Hi, so good afternoon. Um, this is the May 16th meeting of the Transportation Advisory Committee. Um, and I just need to go ahead and read the statement about virtual meetings. Um, So it said here, pursuant to the chapter 20 of the acts of 2021 and extended by chapter 22 of the acts of 2022, <laughs> this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the meeting real time. So, okay, we can go ahead and get started. So I will just ask, um, we can just do a roll call. Um, Amber had asked us to be good about that. So I guess if everybody can just chime in. Um, so so Chris is here. Chris, you can hear? Yep. Chris, yep. okay. And Stefan? Yep, Stefan Tree. Okay. And Joe is here too. Joe? Yep. Hey, everybody. Excellent. Okay, so we have our four members, um, and then we have Guilford, Chris Pressup, and we have our two guests from the Palmer um, train station rail stop proposal. So if you guys just want to introduce yourself, too. Sure. Um, I'm Ann Miller. And, oh, and I'm Ben Hood, but she's going to talk about us first. <laughs> okay, great. All sure. right. Well, welcome. Thank you for Thank joining you. us. Ben and I moved to uh, the Valley in 2002. Um, we were retired academic librarians, so we moved out here at that point um, to work at the colleges. We both worked at UMass at some point and, it, and at the other colleges, several of the other colleges as well Great. over the years. Welcome. So also, um, Guilford, so Rob Kustner is in the audience, and can we go ahead and let him in as a panelist too, please? Sure. He wanted to be available for this discussion. There he goes. All right. And uh, George Ryan is in the audience as well. But last time George asked to continue to be a attendee and not a panelist. George, if you change your mind, you're welcome to raise your hand. OK, um, go ahead. So Anne and Ben, take it away. OK, so and hi, Rob. So uh, we started, um, we got involved in the train effort in 2015. At that point, um, the state of Massachusetts, along with um, Connecticut and uh, Vermont on, and the Federal Railroad Administration were looking at a plan to uh, revive passenger rail from Boston uh, to New Haven in New York and to Montreal, both via Springfield. Uh, Palmer was in that plan as a potential stop, but it was very tentative. Um, so we started advocating to have Palmer made uh, an actual stop in that plan. Uh, we did succeed at that. So Palmer became uh, a stop in that 2000. Uh, it was released in 2016. It was called the Neary Plan. Um, and then we were also able to keep Palmer as a stop, uh, listed as a future stop in the follow-up plan, uh, which was called that you've probably heard of the East-West Passenger Rail Study Plan. Um, after some years of delay, the state has decided to go forward with passenger rail. Um, the East-West study looked at, instead of the Boston to New Haven and New York via Springfield and the Montreal connection, the um, East-West was looking at Boston to Pittsfield. So now the state is going forward with passenger rail with um, sort of a, um, a hybrid of the two. They're, they're looking at uh, Boston to Springfield initially, and then Springfield to Albany. So it's, it is slightly different, but they are going forward with it. Governor Healy has designated a uh, design of a new Palmer station and track work in Pittsfield as what she calls early action items. So that has begun. Uh, ben is actually on the uh, state administered committee that's looking at the design of the Palmer station. So that that committee consists of MassDOT um, and their new um, West East Rail director. Is that the proper term? And, um, I do have the name right, Andy Kozel. And Andy Kozel. So it's called West East Rail now. <laughs> and um, also a, a consultant, VHB, who was hired by MassDOT. And um, so they are 
providing you know the sort of technical expertise on the conceptual design um and and that that is expected to last for about 18 months and should result in how do we also pay for whatever design is is developed um so that's one of the reasons why we thought it was very important to talk to people in amherst is that the design of our station is pretty crucial to how any future connection to Amherst will occur. And we really don't want that. For one thing, we wouldn't even be a station if we weren't on the line to Amherst. You know, we are on the line to Springfield, but we're not in the in the sort of metro area category that gets a lot of attention these days. Um, and I do think the Healy administration has shown an interest in rural development, which is nice. But none of that guarantees a place like Palmer a stop on a, on a on an Amtrak line. Um, Maine has had a very successful line with a lot of stops of of mixed types of you know cities, small towns, the down easter. So that model could work very well across Massachusetts and down into Connecticut, and probably across the rest of Western Massachusetts to Albany. Um, but we really think that Palmer's existence is linked to Amherst. And um, so do we leave out anything about? I mean, historically, Palmer was uh, an important railroad nexus, believe it or not. Um, it was at the junction of six railroads and, and nearly seven. So it, it's called the town of seven railroads. That's the town's nickname. So our interest uh, in coming to speak to you was, um, well, first of all, that Amherst, we know your transportation plan had um, the goal of retaining that advocacy of, of recreating uh, passenger rail to Amherst someday. So I believe you're, that's in your, it's on page 2-14 of your 2015 transportation plan. And we, we want to make sure that that advocacy stays in any future plans or documents, um, even if the state doesn't have a plan immediately to revive that line. Um, but we, you know, that, that would be goal number one. And actually the, the thing I was forgetting, the, um, the importance of Amherst is, has, was demonstrated during the previous period from about 2019 to 2021, where, where they were doing the East West rail study and we had a town committee. So we had the town very officially behind us as far as saying, you should have regional representation. You should have the, um, you know, the people in town who are the key players speaking to the state. And so we were making the case for Palmer all the way through. And the case for Palmer is literally the title of the Amherst, uh, UMass Amherst Center for Economic Development study of Palmer as a potential train stop. But I think the really key documents always were and the, and the key sort of letters and uh, support that we got um, you can see them, um, if you look at our website, this is where you'll find information. I don't know if someone can screen share our, our, our website or not, but. Yeah. I mean, I've shared it before. We can't do it in this format on zoom, but I've shared it with the committee members. When you initially contacted us, I shared it and, uh, and that's fine. Shared it. And so, it has a letter of endorsement for right. Palmer rail stop from both the town manager and then also the council. Right. And so ha having Paul Bockelman and the town council both, you know, say that we should have a stop and that Amherst should have its stop back and, and you know, and that there's a connection there. That's been a key argument for us. Unfortunately, I think that the thing missing in this argument is that MassDOT doesn't really at this point acknowledge that Amherst is even being considered for the return of passenger rail service, which is a little sad because, you know, they could very easily, PVTA is already committed to running a bus down. I'm sure we can get UMass Amherst eventually to run a van, you know, at the right times to connect it for students. But bus and van are nice, but there should be a future plan for train service. And we really don't want that to, to get forgotten, you know, because they did the whole central corridor study. I was just talking and meeting, um, your planner um, about the previous campaign, which which led up to our campaign, 
where people from Amherst and Palmer and Connecticut towns actually pushed really hard to get the Central Corridor going so that you would have Yukon and Norwich and New London and Brattleboro and Amherst all on another train line with a lot of people around it. And they concluded that this was actually not really worth doing at this point, but should you should keep an eye on it for the future. Well, MassDOT says things like that, but then they don't keep an eye on them. So we have to force them to keep an eye on this. Mm -hmm. And I think we need we need a group of people who can actually get Amherst back on the on that on that on that radar in Boston for where the train should be going. Because you can easily just have a train continue right through Palmer and end up in Amherst rather than Springfield. The tracks just split and you just have to make the connection. Um, it could even be, you know, without stopping in Palmer, if there's a train from Amherst to Boston, or it can stop in Palmer either way. And then you have, you you know, trains should connect and they should, sh you know, share different routes so that people can move around, you know, very easily. And one immediate concern for us is Ben is on that, as I said, that committee that's looking at the siting of the future Palmer, we'll call it a platform because it probably won't have a building, but um, but it might be at our historic station. It, it may be at the historic station, which would be convenient for future Amherst service, but that may be logistically difficult. We want to make sure there's sufficient advocacy from Amherst and or UMass that that connection, that the station is not sighted in such a place that revival of that line would be difficult. Or if, or if it were revived, it would not stop in it would not, you know, there would not be an easy connection at Palmer for people from Amherst trying to go to Boston. If if that line were revived, you don't want them to have to, like, you want you want some kind of connection there, um, that that's seamless. So you know, citing the station is actually a bit complicated in order to do that because the the location of the historic station, um, some people say doesn't lend itself well to recreating a, or to, to not recreating, but to creating a contemporary train platform um, that would allow that. So, you know, we feel like if there was enough advocacy coming from Amherst and UMass, the state would be um, more sensitive about placing the future Palmer station in the correct location for revival of service on the central corner. And I just have one last thing to add to this. Um, so um, in an email that, that Tracy wrote, she, she, to us, she mentioned that she had talked to Rob about Rob Kustner about, about the, the, the need to, you know, get a, people together and, and, and work on this, you know, there should be interested people who could advance this as a cause. We'd like to sort of add to that, that not only would we think we'd be a good fit for working with people in Amherst because we've tried over the last nine years several times to reach people at UMass with varying degrees of success. So we know a bunch of people there and, you know, some like Rob are, are quite active and have been out to the state meetings and spoken out and, and you know, and done things behind the scenes. Others have been very sympathetic, but we're not sure we've really got them fully engaged. But we also are tied in with the rail advocates across Western Mass. So I know that sometime maybe last year, uh, mm -hmm. Ben Heckscher came to your your committee. I think it might have been the year before. Year before. But, yeah. You know, and we we knew that and we knew that sometime we should try to talk to you, but we were waiting until there was a reason to. And we think 2024 is the year there's a reason to. And we think that if we could get the advocates from the Western Mass Rail Coalition, which Ben and we founded uh, a number of years ago, we can advance all the trains on all sides, up on the northern tier, in the valley, and on the east-west line, you know, and down to New York City. And, and, and all of that would be something that Amherst should be connected to because it's an important place with a big university in it. Yeah, we, we work pretty closely with Ben Heckscher of Trains in the Valley. We, we're actually probably seeing him next week, but we, we um, yeah, we talk to him all the time. So we, we've coordinated on almost all of our advocacy since they they came in a little after us but uh, ever since we've worked heavily or we work closely with with ben so yeah so so we feel like that that that's very helpful for us in terms of when well, i think we see ourselves as having the same goal basically so anyway yeah I, rob's got his so, hand up. well actually can i just uh chris Russell had her hand up first uh I don't know if Anne and Ben, if you've met Chris Russell before. She's the planning director. We just yes, met her, we met her earlier. Um, okay. <laughs> started. Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, Rob Kustner worked with 
Jonathan Tucker, who was the former planning director on this project, and he's much more knowledgeable about it than I am. So I would <laughs> defer to whatever he has to say, uh, but I'm interested in working on the project too. And I, I know that after Ann and Ben reached out to me originally, I mean, one of, I did reach out to the town manager about it. You know, they didn't contact him directly. And he mentioned that there had been a, like the previous, like, I don't know, somebody, some previous town manager, or economic development director or something had been involved with the real effort. Does that sound familiar, Rob? Maybe, maybe Larry Schaefer or something. And so. Exactly. Um, and I know too that Anna Devlin Gothier right now, like one of her roles on the council is like being a liaison on state issues, like with the legislature and stuff. So she might be a good contact as well on the states on the town side. Hmm. But if I may, can I just add a couple of things? It was really good to actually meet Ann and Ben just about a week, week, a week and a half ago. And uh, weather much like today. So I have a really good sense from them, both of what they can do and also what the Palmer Station is like, the station area is like. Uh, if you've never been to the actual historic station, it's just, it's worth a visit also. Um, let, let me add something that probably is not familiar to folks who are in the background. And, and I think Ann and Ben know this, but it has to do with the amount of investment that's already happened in the line between New London, Palmer, and on up to uh, Brattleboro that goes right through Amherst. During, um, I think, both the present and the previous administrations, and the previous, previous one, the Obama, Biden, that other one, and then the Biden administration, the Federal Railway Administration, I think it's FRWA, invested it, – basically gave a grant to the to the uh, the owners of the of the of the roadway the trackway there uh, very substantial grant i think it was in the 50 between 50 and 100 million dollars to upgrade the rail to the highest standard of of continuous welded rail it's heavy rail and so that's an investment you know, there are many other projects that we think about in this part of the, the commonwealth that you know get millions of dollars of state funds and occasionally some federal funds, but this is a huge investment that's already been made. And so having a railway connection from Amherst to, to Palmer and perhaps further South and further North is a lot's been put into it already. We, we've, we've sort of, we can piggyback off of that. The second thing is there are apparently several private individuals. Uh, one of them, I won't mention the name, but is closely involved with the Palmer area who'd be willing to operate a rail shuttle service between Amherst, especially for the university students and any other people who want to ride it to Palmer with connections to the East and of course to the West, but a good connection would be towards the East. So there's a really, there's a lot of investment already and there are people interested in doing this. If the right model can be constructed. Um, Unfortunately, the you know, let me just finish. My UMass connection, like like Tracy's, we we work at the university. We wish we could call the shots, maybe, but um, you know, wherever the wherever the authority lies right now, I'm sure it's preoccupied with other issues. But maybe at some point in the near future, those other issues will will see a you know be seen in a different way. And getting the tens of thousands of students at the university and the faculty staff that are in the affiliated five colleges, other folks in town who travel very regularly. There are thousands of people who travel each day as commuters to the Boston area. Having a few of them shift over to the rail mode would be fantastic. Having most of the students come to and from campus, not having to bring their cars. Imagine the change that would make in the Amherst area. And let me just add one last thing. One of the people I reached out to some of you may be surprised if you know my reputation as a former town town official, but someone I'm actually pretty close with, and I talk with them from time to time. I mean, like we have each of us have our phone numbers. Is Barry Roberts, and he's he said, "Rob, go for it." You know, he's very interested in doing this. And so, those of you from Amherst know who I'm talking about. I think Ann and Ben may know. I may have dropped the name to to them, but but I think it's good to have people who who have long history of caring about you know, the, the development of the town and, and who see the, the town of Amherst as, you know, a, a leader in 
in new ideas, this would be a, a, a good new old idea, a good old new idea. Okay. So anyway, that's okay. what I would add to that. I'll okay, stick thanks. around, but I'll, I'll Go mute. ahead. Um, so Chris Lindstrom. You just have to unmute. Hi. Yeah, so um, I'm just trying to get a handle on, um, or l let me sort of, if I can, I'll just try to repeat what I think the, um, you know, the the issue is or the concern and then what the opportunity is. I, I can't quite tell. I don't quite understand what the opportunity is. But um, the issue is that in the sort of new scheme in the Healy administration, um, there's interest in West East Rail, but um, it would be not including Amherst. Uh, or it would be with a station that would not make Amherst easily linkable to that West East network. And so that's what the difficulty is. And so, and the opportunity is to now, because a decision is being made about the location of the Palmer station, we should be weighing in because we want that link. Is that what I'm hearing is the actual sort of current place for advocacy or anyway, I don't know. I'm just trying to wrap my head around the opportunity. Thank you for asking Chris, because I had the same sort of question about how we can participate, Ann and Ben. If you look, if you look at the statements from our political leaders, and I would say that includes Senator Comerford, Senator Oliveira, who's our senator, um, and many of the reps in the area, um, from the hill towns all the way down to, you know, to the Palmer area and over to Longmeadow. Everyone focuses in Western Mass on the importance of Amherst and UMass. And Palmer's kind of the stand-in station on the East-West line just because of proximity. I think historically, if you look at where people took trains, I think you might find Emily Dickinson or her family riding somehow down towards our line, you know, through um through Mount Holyoke or something, you know, and it's like it's like a it's like a it's where the the, the tracks are. So Palmer on the East-West line is the best stop if you're going to Boston, you know, otherwise the next stop is Worcester, which is fine. And, you know, and the PVTA was smart enough to create a Amherst to Worcester bus, which apparently has been successful yeah. enough because I'm the rep for Palmer to the PVTA. And I have to say that that's, that was great news. I thought that if, if people will ride a bus just to Worcester, which doesn't even get them to Boston until they switch to a commuter rail train, then think what will happen when they can take a bus or van to Palmer and take the train all the way to South Station with many stops along the way, including Worcester and and uh, two. But stops. some people I think are ending in Worcester, and that bus doesn't run every day. Is that right? Like I remember looking in the schedule isn't daily. It's and it's been it's That's COVID true. had a severe impact yeah. on it, and yet it survived and 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 seemed to have a you know such good ridership at times that it was actually overcrowded. So that could have been something to do with you know driver shortages and smaller buses too, but. It certainly proved that um, what Rob was saying, that there's a lot of students who are going to ride these trains, buses, whatever, that, that go east. So Palmer is a good stand-in for this. The political leaders in the West understand that, that Palmer is a good connection to Amherst. But the thing that people are not focusing on, the study that sort of gave us our station, the big study, not the East-West Rail study, but the earlier study from 2016, well, it's a year older than the Central Corridor study from 2017. So it's not too late to get the state to pay attention to what it spent money on. And it spent money on a study of the Central Corridor. And we think that Amherst is the sort of the, the big place in the Massachusetts part of that study. I would argue that UConn is, is the big place in the Connecticut part of that study. Right. If we could get the Connecticut people who've been really good on trains for many years longer than Massachusetts state officials have been, 
I think UConn and UMass would get a train, sort of what Rob was describing. Some somebody, even an, an entrepreneur, might be willing to do that train. But the state will need to support it. And the state has been good. I'll say this. They've been very good about supporting things like our Quaybog connector, which we've been very involved with, to connect a bunch of towns in our area, which have virtually no mass transit, yeah, no, no public right. connections to anything. It's drive or walk. And, you know, and that's a terrible situation for many people in rural areas. But the last thought has understood that they've supported the efforts locally to create transportation. And the Worcester route is another example of that, because the Quaybaugh Connector people have been involved in getting that Worcester route up and, and, and other Route 9, you know, connections on bus. But we just think that the state should be moving the train forward. So I, I will add one other thing to what Rob said um, about the upgrades to the Central Corridor Line and acknowledging, I'm going to acknowledge right off that Central Corridor Line is not on the state agenda right now, um, but advocacy could at least keep it on the back burner. Um, so the thing is that line, those upgrades were done for freight purposes. Um, and they continued, I think, beyond what Rob's talking about. Um, so I believe now all of that line, at least in Massachusetts has, been, and actually probably in Connecticut as well, has been upgraded primarily for freight purposes. Um, but coincidentally, this does make it easier to run passenger rail on it. And historically, or what we've always heard, is the owner of the line has always been more amenable to passenger rail than um, CSX, which would which will be the owner of the East West or West East, what's now called West East Line. CSX had to be pretty much backed into a corner to agree to passenger rail on on the West East Rail Line. So, um, supposedly, I think it's Genesee, Wyoming, uh, but or New England Central. That supposedly the owner is more uh, more amenable. Um, but it, in, indeed, in the short run. Um, um, Christine's right that we're we're we 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 want we're we're looking for the advocacy for the siting of the Palmer Station to make that future connection possible. I should say the Healy administration doesn't really have a position that's that's negative about any of this. They're actually the ones pushing the 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 stop in Palmer, and I think they probably recognize that the UMass connection and the and the and the Amherst connection is is very important for that. The thing that they are not aware of, and this is true of Governor Baker, um, he seemed almost oblivious to the fact that they'd had this massive study that they'd already done. And before it was published, they, they he, he got sort of backed into doing a million dollar study, the East West Rail study of sort of a similar thing, but with an extension to Pittsfield. And so there's a lot of this that happened in the state government where they could be working on you know, the plan that will replace the plan they're, they're still working on, you know, and they're going to build, say, the mall outside the Mullen Center this year, but then they're going to rebuild it next year because they're already working on that other plan, you know, and you got to be careful with the state and then try to hold them to what they've, what they've already done. And so I think it's not too late to, to push the Amherst, you know, um, central corridor connection you had a train that stopped there and picked people up and yeah, let them recently. off. And it was the Vermonter. <laughs> We're not is, talking about the Which is a Washington, D.C. Right? To, to, you know, to Vermont right. train service from Amtrak. Right. It's a right. great service. But, I mean, I guess, I mean, one challenge I, I see on the north-south rail, at least, is that because that Northampton stop now, like that, I mean, there's been a lot of investment on the other side of the river with the stops. And my understanding is that the Northampton stop is like one of the most popular stops, like along that whole corridor. So, um, so can, can most be, of, most of I mean, I, is going uh, south to New York and Philadelphia. Yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I just I so I'm not sure how quickly. I mean, I, I, I you know, as Chris Lynch was saying just about um, just in terms of like what we can help with in terms of like, you know, advocating for like the Palmer for their the stop to be placed so you could have a future connection things but well know, I think that, yeah I mean I think we're just talking about here the yeah. AMA stop in relation to getting to Boston right oh yeah well I mean because some people else, had talked to more else. south yeah. but yeah well, to, to Boston and possibly south to Mansfield full corners where Yukon is or even to the yeah to yeah assuming it goes that way yes absolutely yeah. right no of course yeah but thank you. Uh, thank you for coming and filling us in on some of that. 
Yeah. Thank you for inviting us because we actually yeah. feel like the Amherst connection got us to where we are today. Right. And so, you know, mm -hmm. we don't we don't want to lose the connection to to you all. And it's nice to meet more of you, basically. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you want to send us like some key links to look at, like we can circulate them around our group and then also you know, as I said, Rob and I had talked about other people we could like reach out to. Again, as an advisory committee, we don't have like a lot of power. Um, and I think it is important to involve like the local officials and, and it's great that the planning director is here. And so people with more power than tax. So, um, but that would help just, you know, we're just not as familiar with like some of the studies as you are, of course. So I'll, I'll say one really brief thing. So um, when they did the East West Rail study, they actually sort of identified what people should be at the table. And they said Westfield should be at the table. Now, Westfield, I worked at Westfield State College at one point, but it became Westfield State University. So Westfield is a place with a university in it now. Westfield didn't come to the table. They showed up at the first meeting. They never came back and they never showed any interest in the East West Rail study. And now they're talking trains that would go right through Westfield. And Westfield suddenly had a new mayor, I think a year or two ago. And he sent someone to a meeting to sort of say greetings from the mayor of Westfield. You know, it's like they were a little late to the to the thing. They could have been at the table and been a stop on the East West Rail study. Instead, Westfield was left out. They had a university. Well, Amherst has a much bigger university and, you know, you're not on the East West Rail Line. So you couldn't be at the table for that one. Uh, actually, they have a two. But, uh, yeah, I mean, college. you got colleges, yeah, you got college. a couple yeah. colleges and a uh, university. Yeah. You know, sure. it's like it adds up. And, and there's no reason why Boston and Amherst should not be connected. I can't think of anything in Western Massachusetts that should be more connected to Boston. And I say this as a Springfield area resident than Amherst. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But also just um, if you do share our links and if you just spread the word, we we know um, you guys are all involved in other things. So you're not taking on this level of personal advocacy yourself, but um, just giving, you know, the links to people or telling them to. Contact. Yeah, no, I would. If you want to just share back like a couple, I mean, you did share that at your initial website, but also just like some of the key studies or things like that. I think that that would just be helpful. Can just I just say like, one, one quick word? So, so one thing I like to say: their website, Ann and Ben have created a great website. Oh, it is great. One, yeah. one, one of the one of the links is known as A to B. It's not Ann to Ben, but it's you know people say in the transportation business we're in the business of getting from A to B very efficiently, and A to B is like Amherst to the Boston area. I think it's a brilliant logo, and it's it's just putting this community back into the network that has existed for a century and a half and probably should continue to exist. For as yeah, long definitely. As well, thank you. Thank you all. And thank you, Rob. Thanks, thanks, thanks for having me. Thank you all for right. having us. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really help yeah, helpful. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay. All right. So. Can I stick on. around and just listen? I mean, I don't have you to. Can. Be Do you want to like. You still have that weird backlighting thing going on, but if you want to, uh, yeah. Go ahead, you can stay. We can demote you back to the audience if you want. <laughs> um, all right, so the um, the next thing on our agenda was to talk about the Heatherstone project. We had talked about it previously, um, and I thought we had a good discussion. And then there was this um, listening session that TSO held on Monday. Um, which I attended. I don't know if anybody else was there because yeah, I was there. Yeah. So as is typically the case, right? It was done as a webinar, so you actually have no idea who's in the room unless you're a panelist. Mm -hmm. I guess Guilford was a panelist. He knew who was there. Guilford, how many people were there? We had about there's a little, well over twelve people, twelve or fourteen people who talked, and there was another probably. A, Close to ten people who didn't say anything. I think Chris was listening in, and she didn't want to I say anything. It, it was it was a good discussion. Yeah. So Guilford, I mean, there were. I thought it was really helpful that um, you gave some updates on the project from what you know was originally sent out, including about details of the size of the roundabout, the potential takings, the. Some of the other pieces, you know, even the fact too that it's already 
going out to bid and everything, do you want to fill in some of that additional information for for people who weren't at the listening session? Um. So yeah, I mean, the, we've already bid the we kind of bid this work already because um because we have um the we we just got ahead of the curve on what we we're gonna do so. It's bid. Um, we've kind of laid everything out already. There is, if we do three mini roundabouts, we might take a little four or five square foot piece of property from one one property, and that's all we would take. Everything else will fit in the public way. We're shooting for the really small roundabouts, the ones that have anywhere from a four to a five foot ion in the middle. It's meant basically just to be a, a horizontal deflection that moves you to moves you to the right, back to the left, and then you continue down the road. Um, it's not meant to be a vertical deflection where you go up and down all the way down the road like at UMass now. Yeah. Do you want to share that picture from the sample? I know it was on the, I think it, it's on my, I pulled it up too. From one of it, was it like Portland or something? Um, I actually, I don't think I shared that one. Well, you did, you did in the meeting, you pulled it up, but um, let me see if I can find it. No, oh, actually, I can, I can, hold on, I can do this. There's music playing in the background, huh? We believe in you, Guilford. <laughs> hold on. Here, I, I have the link. It's just like you're, you know, you're, you're on screen. I, I can share also... it. Hold on, let me okay. share. I have it as well. I only got one screen going today, so I have to, uh. All right. It's the one. So this is actually the video. Oh. It's not a picture. I have the picture, the one that was. Is it out of the NACTO book? I have that one. Actually, this is a real one. Okay. So this is actually so driving is through it. Located? No, is this the one in Arlington? No, this is actually one one in Portland. Okay. And you can kind of see it's not a big intersection here. These are really small roads. It's, so that's it. That's how you do it. And that's how big they are. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So one of the things I was, well, with that particular design, like with all that vegetation in the middle, like, is that actually a good idea? And I know that there was a public comment at one of the TSO meetings about how great that can be too but to me like i think that the well i mean one there's the main issues but also just like in terms of the sight lines like i really don't feel like you'd want to have like much vegetation <laughs> in those little mini roundabouts i mean we don't necessarily have to have a uh, palmer situation where you have that little planter thing with like nothing in it whatever i don't even know if that was ever intended to be a mini roundabout yeah that was but actually just historic what is that intended to be it's just it's just historic it's actually it's actually People one of the people have asked me about it, but um so if you if you go throughout many of the towns in New, in Massachusetts, you'll see um historic signs that were the guideposts, which the mileposts of different towns. And that was the one that was in in uh, that's the one that's in it's in Thorndike. No, is it? Bonds no, it's Bondsville. It's Bondsville. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's in Bondsville. So that's the historic oh, okay. one for Bondsville. And so no one wants to really move it because it's historic. Okay. So it's not a mini roundabout. It's just a little something in the it's middle. A, it's something <laughs> in the middle, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, but I think we would probably leave the plantings out as we play around with these. Um, well, so, yeah. So that's why I wanted to... Let me see if I can just like share my screen on this. But um, so I'm just going to share... I mean, so I was just kind of curious, especially because you've talked about doing it as a pilot, right? Can people see that? So, I mean, there's these ones that are set up and it looks very temporary, right? That it has like signs and what is this like hay bales or something? Yeah. Um, do you see, because you are going to pilot it first, do you see doing something super temporary or do, 
would you pave like a curb or something there? We're going to probably pave a curb, a curb, and then we're going to pave on top of it and then uh, put the color imprint. So it's green or something on top of that. Yeah. Um, the, the issue we have is, is that you could let like a moving van go into the neighborhood without having to go through these, but then he would probably have to draw the moving van would probably have to drive over one or two of these to get out of the neighborhood. Um, just the way the neighborhoods are set up. It's, uh, in Portland and Arlington and other communities, it's kind of easier when you have a parallel road system because you just go down the next road um here you can't go down the next road um so we, we would probably well i guess you can go over to pelham road i mean um to um uh the next what is that other the one on you know, the but pelham, i mean just having a drive the... out yeah. having the ability to drive over it's not a big deal right but um i mean it keeps the same idea right it's a visual and visual reason for you to get to move your car out of the way slow down all that sort of stuff so yeah yes okay. so that, that's kind of what we're looking we're looking at and all right um and then was there any commentary uh i'm i'm sorry i wasn't able to make it was there a commentary regarding the sidewalk well so yeah so chris i i was interested in actually kind of going through like some of the key elements of what was in the proposal that um that the town manager and the Guilford sent forward to the council. So there was this one part with the sidewalk, right? Um, there is. And so the sidewalk is currently proposed. It's proposed to be on the east side, and it's proposed to go from Pelham Road to the north um, Aubinwood intersection because Aubinwood loops around, and then it comes out down near like Gatehouse Road and Stony uh -huh. Hill and things. Um Wait, the sidewalk continues on Aubinwood or? The no, and no, no, it would just be, this section would only be, it would be too Heather, because they are proposing to repave the road there. It would just be from Pelham Road to the north intersection of Aubinwood and it wouldn't continue south and Echo Hill to the other parts. But, but Guilford, you were saying at the listening session on Monday, right, that you would propose like within the, you know, in the next year or two that you and would continue to pave it. And then when you do that, you would do the sidewalk. Yes. Yeah, so in the next construction cycle, when we're in there, we would just continue with the pavement and with the sidewalk. And the sidewalk would be contained within the current um, area where the pavement is. Is that right? The pavement is now wide enough to accommodate two lanes of traffic plus a sidewalk, right? It is. Yeah. So one question I had is just you had mentioned on Monday that you have like the cost estimates like it. And I mean, this is a little about side of tax scope, but is there does adding the sidewalk increase the cost very much? Or is it not that different than doing the just straight paving? So if we actually if we did away, well, <clears throat> if, if we um, if we pave the road as wide as it is now. It would be basically the same cost. So it's a small incremental cost to put the sidewalk in. So we can either narrow so the even road. without like with curbing and stuff, it's not like a lot of added costs. No, because we I mean if we You're gonna we, curb anyway, right? Yeah. We are, but yeah. But there isn't a curb there now. There's no curb there now, is there? Uh there's going there's going to be curb on the side with the sidewalk. There's actually kind of curb there now. There's no curb on the other side. There's asphalt curb, right? Yes. Yeah. Is that what you would put in? We would. Mm -hmm. So unless we narrow the road, which we probably wouldn't do because the buses use it, um, if we don't do the sidewalk, we're just going to pave it the width it is. That's it. It's just going to go put back what was there. Um, if we put the sidewalk in, we narrow it a little bit. And then so you're actually just taking – pavement that would be for the road and raising it up into a sidewalk that's really so that's why the price is not really that different than if you did just resurfacing okay that did that makes sense yeah sort of i just always thought sidewalks are really expensive well i guess it depends because you know, they have you, all the, you don't, the you don't have any paving, and... right so you you're just using the existing footprint 
Correct. So it's it's that's that's why it's just the same. And yeah. then also, right, you have to add like the curb cuts, like at the streets, right, yeah. right. Correct. But that's they're they're not going to be concrete. They're just going to be well, actually. That may be the one cost that we wouldn't have is the uh, because I think we do have to do concrete at the intersections now. That's I think it would be really good for the kids in that neighborhood to have this kind of a sidewalk because kids currently ride in the street on Heatherstone Road and the traffic is really fast and having sidewalks there would be great. So one thing about, so one question I had just, you know, from the comments I've um, heard at the meetings and also just, you know, from people who've reached out to me about the project is that, it, I mean, I have heard a lot of support for sidewalks in that area, um, but it, it's been interesting to me that almost nobody who actually lives on that section of Heatherstone has commented about the sidewalks and whether they want sidewalks in their front yard or not. Um, so I don't know if you, if Guilford, if you've heard from people, I mean, somebody anecdotally told me who lives in Echo Hill, like, oh, in, you know, in North Echo Hill, now people are selling because they don't want a sidewalk on their property. Oh, and on, that's not there was, there was this one <laughs> older woman, right, who came to the TSO meeting in March and she said she lives there and she doesn't want a sidewalk. And that, she's, the but I mean, person. to me, I mean, I really do like sidewalks a lot. I do think that they can improve safety, but then I also just worry about if the sidewalk isn't well maintained or also the potential burden on those property owners, particularly like older people or people who don't have the resources. And I mean, we just have so many sidewalks in town that are, have like some maintenance issues or that aren't shoveled regularly, right? Like I don't, this, this sidewalk isn't gonna go on your list of things that you shovel as a courtesy. I'm so, it's not been proposed. so I just don't, I just don't know I mean, I just am wondering too, just because we haven't heard from those people, um, but then also people know that that would, that's what it would entail, like, right? So, I mean, the Echo Hill North, they had done a survey in 2016, it's on their website, um, when there were, you know, a lot of, there was a lot of thinking about speeding the neighborhood and safety and so on. And the survey that they did at that time, they asked, they asked, residents if they wanted to have a sidewalk on Heatherstone or Aubinwood or both or neither. And the most popular response was like neither. Oh, that's so, interesting. I live so, on Heatherstone Road. I should have so, said that to begin with because that's a conflict of interest, right? But you live on Heatherstone on the other section, though, don't you? I live you? on the other side of Aubinwood where there wouldn't be a sidewalk in this project, but I would Right, on the next project, yeah. The continued project, project, yeah. So anyway. So that's just been something on my mind or just about. We do receive many phone calls from people who want sidewalks there. So I don't, I guess if they did that survey, some of those, these people must be new or something. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it could be a generational thing too. Yeah, I mean, I know in that survey too, they also asked about like, do you have kids? Do you not have kids? You know, things like that. Um, he's against somebody who doesn't want any change and wants the status quo is not going to call the DPW and be like, I love this. Keep it like it is. They just, you know, they're not going to. Yeah, be but they might say, wow, I don't want a sidewalk in front of my <laughs> property or something. <laughs> you know, Well, I think right. people are worried about takings of land. The only thing I've heard right. in negative of the people that I talked to is someone was worried that some of their land might be taken. And I don't think that's going to be true. It sounds like it's going to be fitted, fitted within the existing pavement width. So, yeah. Although, and, just, and, to, just to say something, the people in, um, actually, I can't say, I can't say Amherst. People in New England have the theory that their property goes from the edge of the asphalt all the way into their property. Mm -hmm. They don't believe any of the grass space or any other space that's not paved, um, whether it's sidewalk or grass, is, is um, on town property. So even if you move a bit into the town property you own as grass, people get upset in mm -hmm. this region. It's true. So, um, yeah. So I guess, I mean, well, and I do like the idea that if the sidewalk is going to be continued within the next few years, you know, so if you look at the bike ped plan for, 
Network's plan from 2019, right? It actually recommends as a priority having sidewalks on the other end of Heatherstone, like coming up from, not that it's Heatherstone, but Gate, Gatehouse Road, like that ends, and then coming into the neighborhood um, just because there is so much pedestrian traffic in that section of Echo Hill. And it, it doesn't identify the north section of Heatherstone, but if 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 there's also going to be improvements there, I think like the network is important. You know, having that whole network, and then um and and then hopefully, you know, there is some work being done on Beltra Town Road, and then also Pelham. Of course, we need to do some work on the Pelham sidewalks too, <laughs> because I mean, one of the things I've heard is that people really are interested in it for like their kids getting to Fort River. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, Pelham is one of the hardest roads we're gonna have to we're gonna have we're gonna have the most issues doing any type of improvement other than just paving it. I mean the Echo Hill folks, again, this is anecdotal and I'm kind of like if you didn't show up at the listening session to say that you don't want the sidewalk, I'm not sure why. I, I don't know. I just feel like the onus is on those those property owners who are hesitant about the sidewalk to say something. And if they didn't show up or they haven't shown up and we still haven't gotten any feedback, I'm not sure I want I want to spend time on the committee really considering that point of view. No, no, for um, sure. And and, that and said, um anyway, that said, orienting towards the families who are particularly involved in safe routes to school, you know, sending their kids on bikes to Fort River and, and going with them. I think they are excited about Heatherstone, but only the, really the families with the older kids who they know their kids can adequately, um, you know, maneuver around those, the obstacles that are in the sidewalks on Pelham Road. So almost everybody says that once the Belchertown Road project is complete, or, you know, we know we're doing phase one, which is up to wherever that is, Colonial Village from the intersection. But they're basically looking forward to that, the bike lane and the sidewalk being the way that they would go with younger kids. And phase 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 two, or I guess we're call it, calling it phase two of Belchertown Road is probably next year. So I think they're they're just thinking that, you know, when you're there and of course, nobody's sending their younger child on a bike by themselves. It's the parents going in with the kids. On the, right, right. You know, together. And so they're thinking that they would be on the bike lane and that the kid would be on the on the sidewalk on Route mm -hmm. 9. Sure. And that's how they would do it. They wouldn't go down Pelham Road with the younger kids. Yeah, I mean, I think some people go on Route 9 now, right? So, yeah, makes sense. It's like a wider sidewalk and everything. Um, yeah, and I, I mean, and Chris, to your point, like, I mean, I did ask somebody in the neighborhood and, you know, they have email lists around the neighborhood too. And the this person, um, she, she mentioned that, like, there really hasn't been much discussion or debate about the sidewalk, so... I mean, just, you know, just as another reference point about if people are weighing in or not. <laughs> so, yeah, I would say the listening ses I mean, so. session was overall very positive towards yes, no, sidewalks and the, the roundabout Absolutely. solutions. Yeah, everybody wanted to see some form of traffic calming, and they saw that roundabouts were the way forward on that one as it's proposed. So, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, and what I heard, so right, so the project, starting from the Pelham Road end, right there, there's this little median there, which it seems, I mean, I haven't, it seems that people have sort of universally agree that that should be removed. I haven't heard, I think I've only heard one comment ever about that it should be kept, but the people who are walking on that section of the road were saying that just given car speeds um, and the narrowness right there, that it may I mean, one of the people who lives at Jason said that it does calm the traffic, but then it's but it's also just not that safe, and you end up on people's like properties, or on the more you know on the west side on the wood in the woods more or something that you just don't have any room to maneuver, and so um, I mean so right so the proposal, Guilford this proposal that's going forward, 
um, is to get rid of that median and to do the sidewalk yes. and to do the mini roundabouts. Yes. So, I mean, that all seems like pretty good <laughs> if we want to if we want to take a vote and support that. I mean, I do have some some questions about it, but um, I mean, what do what do other committee members think? Joe. Well, Tracy, when you say questions, you're saying that no, I mean, I have some other questions just about other like oh, other okay. parts of the project too. I mean, yeah, but we could just agree that we agree with the con. I mean, and also just you know when when I when I write up you know our feedback, I mean the original memo that went out to the council right it said that the mini roundabouts could be fifty to ninety feet, which is a very different scale than what Guilford's talking about now, where he's talking about four or five feet or five or six feet or whatever. Right. And so at that time, and I think that's probably why people were concerned about taking some things because right. 50 to 90 feet is a lot bigger than the road. Yeah. Right. And it's a lot more urban. And it's a lot more, it's not neighborhoody. And um and I think the more, you know, you can break up the lane, um, more more you can narrow the travel lanes is when you'll get the um slower traffic i mean because some people in the neighborhood have talked about how just with the repaving that they feel like the potholes slow down the traffic now and once you repave that it could be like a speedway so that's exactly the case here on butterfield terrace so yes rob okay i, mean, I know tracy showed some examples of temporary things and I thought maybe there'd be a prefabricated thing, perhaps made out of rubber, perhaps even like the things that became, or at least maybe I became famous for on Lincoln Avenue. Remember the uh, temporary speed bumps? I don't know if they exist, but have you considered just, you know, e even before putting in the actual paved ones, if you already did that, just dropping something like one of those segments there it would have about the same size just to see how people respond to it. I mean, letting them know that it's temporary just so that people get used to it before they start running over something that may be harder. We thought about it, but we're, be we're, we're be placing our bets on people are going to like, and it's going to stay. So we're just doing one and out. Sounds like a good idea. I got a lot of, a uh, lot of feedback. Let's put it that way. <laughs> So, so one thing I was wondering about is um, that this is, you know, just in terms of the traffic speeds and so on. So, right. So with the sidewalk, how, how wide is the road going to be, Guilford? Like I know one section is going to be narrowed to 24 feet, but then. Yeah, actually I was looking for the drawing. <laughs> so is The drawing in the memo, or do you have like a more detailed drawing? Um, the one in the memo is all we have. Oh, okay. I can pull that up. How wide is the pavement now? About 30 feet? It is. Mm -hmm. But I mean, so one thing I was wondering just about just um, that a lot of the res a lot of the local roads in Amherst, right? We don't have any pavement striping um, on them, like to to designate where the lanes are, where the side of the road is, like edge lines or anything. And that. Like even though even though a twelve a twenty four foot road could be considered to be two twelve foot travel lanes, like in practicality, if you're not striping them, that they can actually feel like a lot unless you have very dense traffic that you know that all the cars have to stay on their own sides that it can feel like it's a much wider road, um, and that that could be contributing to the um, that can be contributing to speeding in the neighborhood. Right, so you won't have that at the mini roundabouts, but you would ha you could have that on the straightaways. And in the comments, too, people have said they're concerned about going south on Heather Stone about like some of the curves and things. But is there? I mean, are there? And it is a bus route. I mean, do does Amherst ever stripe lines? Um, no, we we don't do that on on local roads. So never on local roads. The smaller you know, smaller neighborhood roads, we we leave them alone. Um, the, when we did do a couple of them to try to delineate and slow people down, the majority of the comments we got back were that they thought it sped people up and that it made oh. their street look like it was a, a raceway because it had a it had a line down the middle of it. 
and that it was a, a, a road to drive fast on, not a small road. So we kind of stopped doing that and haven't gone back to it. I was just wondering, just because this is also like a bus a bus route and things like that, but that's interesting. So people would feel like if there's a line down the middle of the road, they feel like they should straddle it. <laughs> I'm not, I'm a little surprised actually. They felt they should drive faster. So that, that's what you're talking about right there. Except you're on the wrong side of the road. Is this England? Where is this? Uh, I'm assuming Marcus. I'm talking on mute for like the last five minutes. Yeah, it's it's um in England. Um but yeah, this is a tiny little, you know, sort of little raised hump of acrylic or right, sure. asphalt or whatever. I just think it's interesting with these um, kind of the curbing here where it's a little less than the, you know, the, 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 the footpath type, but it's enough for someone in a, you know, in a moving van or whatever to kind of go over. So I just thought that was kind of interesting. But yeah. And so Guilford, so when you're it. when yeah. you're doing the crosswalks, like your the crosswalks are going to be at these intersections, right? And but because the sidewalk is only going to be on one side of the street, you're not going to have any go across Heatherstone. They're all just going to be parallel to Heatherstone. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, there's no housing really on the other side except in one little section. And then um and how far <laughs> away from the mini roundabout will the crosswalk it will be pretty close i guess yeah they'll be they're gonna end up being kind of close so yeah sorry um it, yeah i mean you've got a crosswalk right here too yeah on this one well just for larger roundabouts right you typically want to try to set it back yeah yeah oh, i mean that's still set yeah. back like a car length ish small car European car, but yeah. European car. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, and then, and then also, you know, at these meetings, people have talked a lot about having the 25 mile per hour speed limit, which is something, you know, that's allowed under chapter 90, section 17C. Or you can have those like across town. You can designate either like certain roads or all of town to have the lower speed limit. Um, and I think that's something that's been on TSO's plate, I think, for since TSO was created or something. I think ever since there was that pedestrian fatality on North Pleasant, north of campus, that people have asked about that. I mean, I don't know. I guess it's going to come back to the council. Gilford, but do you have thoughts about it? Well, it um it doesn't do anything for North Pleasant Street, so it's only that rule is only meant for streets that don't have a tra traffic re regulation on it already. So if you have a traffic regulation, you can't use that. You have to go through the other process of of setting a, a formal speed limit, which actually has become easier to do. Um, but but like some of these towns, right? Like so, Northampton and Springfield and I don't know mm -hmm. Pittsville, they've all adopted the Chapter ninety Section seventeen C yep. throughout town. Yep. So, so do people any, obey any, it? Do people so, obey it? Well, well, first of all, it means only roads that don't have posted speed limits. That's the speed limit. Mm -hmm. um, and then okay. the police have a special way they're supposed to. Um, they can't well actually they, the new rule says you can run radar on it now but they have to do it a certain way so but then the police have to write tickets well i think that i mean that's an issue about for the police about how much enforcement they do and so on but also i think i mean just and and people have brought this up in the public comments too and i i know i feel this way that just because you you change the speed limit right unless you change the configuration of the road unless you make changes to the road to actually slow down the cars they won't necessarily slow down just because you change the sign and i think um, unless you enforce it it's not going and to then also either. enforcement and but if you, you redesign enforce... but if you redesign the road to make it slower then people will go slower too um well that's what guilford's doing yeah no of course 
I mean, Guilford, is there are there posted state limits on Heatherstone now? Um, I think it's a de facto route. I think it's only 30, although Jason thinks there might be a speed regulation. And we keep going back and forth. And we haven't found the speed regulation yet. Oh, for specifically for Heatherstone? Right. So if it's, yeah. What is like but, the mass road? Like what is the mass DOT like road inventory show? Does it show it? It doesn't show it. Okay. So the, so yeah, I mean, right now it's either de facto 30 or it's posted 30 and people aren't driving that. So you go to 25, what's going to happen? Yeah, no. It's really the area between the curve near Stony Hill and where the island is, where the traffic, where the speeds are really high, where people just fly down. I guess they're on their way to work or on their way to the athletic club or something. But they so, really so Chris, speed. by the island, do you mean the median? The median, the median at yeah. the end of the so, road, at the north end of the road. From the median to yeah, the north end, mm -hmm. down to where it takes that curve and goes to Stony Hill. Right, okay. that's kind of a straightaway, and people fly through there. I saw people actually drag racing, um, two lanes going in the same direction Oof. with no care about if anyone was coming in the opposite direction. <laughs> they really. Well, yeah. I mean, I think that's why I was asking if, like, the stri if striping ever helped <laughs> to name designate lanes. Um. So, and 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 you don't think that any um, girlfriend you were talking about like not doing any kind of vertical deflection or anything yeah we try even to if it's very mild like you know not the not what umass has done in front of the mullen center but something like speed tables or something or just near the you know at the approaches to the neighborhood or something yeah so one thing um sorry give me a second there's these things that we the they use quite a lot at home um and they uh let me sorry share they're not like across the street speed table i don't know i haven't really seen them over here but they're like little squares in the middle speed cushion the yeah is that what it is so if you position your car you can go over them just fine but if somebody's coming the other way basically oh, okay. you onto it so you know for buses fire engines that sort of thing they just they plow on through and they're good to go. But when you're coming across somebody, it tends to push you in the car onto, you know, onto the edge or onto the middle of these things. So, yeah. I mean, what's been, Gilford, what's been your experience just with like the, like the lower speed tables, like, um, I don't know, like on Amity or is a crosswalk there raised? It looks like it's raised. It is, but Amity is, Amity is a, I mean, it's a weird creature because people are slowing down. You, because you have, you, you really are slowing down. Because if you, you going, you, you're go, you're going left. Even if you're going straight, you're going right, left. You're slowing down, and so they get to the top of the hill, and and normally they're slowing down. So it's um, it, that one we haven't, we really haven't seen that much is, issues with that one. Um. I mean, you could put them, you could put those along this road, but where are you going to go? I mean, you're just going to be raised, raised, um, bumps. Yeah. Yeah. Speed bumps. They're not gonna well, be I mean, you know, blocks. some roads have those, right? Like Lincoln. I mean, my street has them. They do really help. Yeah, they're just lot. noisy though. That's the thing. Like, well, that, but I was wondering if they're like more like tables, if they're lower, if they're as noisy, but, um, some people say yes. Some people say no. Um, I do I do wonder if they rip up the pavement more though, like with the plows and stuff, but no, you really don't. Oh. You... It's so anyway. Okay. Um do we want to talk about what as a committee we have 20 minutes left and I know we had a couple other things. Um do Did, does any are, Go are you ahead, going to are you, are you gonna make a recommendation on because they're the TSO canceled because there was no recommendation. So if you don't have a recommendation, they're they're not going to talk about this. Well, no, that's not why they canceled, is it? Because they also had like other. I thought they were also doing uh, 
waist hauler bylaw and things like that. They had other items. Well, they canceled. They said one of the reasons they canceled. They said was because um, the ACC and TA TAC didn't get back about this. What they were what they recommended. Well, right. We told them that we wanted to wait until the listening session, which yes. I think makes so, sense. Uh, so you're saying that safety transportation issues aren't coming up on the 530 agenda? They're not coming up on the TSO's agenda. They were, they were supposed to meet at 10 o'clock today, and they canceled. They canceled. One of the reasons they stayed was because there was no... But they, um, they have... But... um. The chair, Andy Steinberg, had said that they were planning to discuss a lot of traffic related stuff on the 30th. Is that still the case? They do. And I don't know how they're going to do it all, but they do plan to do that. And um, and were you going to be at that meeting, too? Me? Yeah. My... I don't know. They were at, they were going to reach out to DPW and... Uh, yes, we're going to be there. And police and stuff. Talk about speed limits and lots of other things. So the question is, do we make a recommendation or do we want to vote to make a recommendation and have um, a memo drawn up and sent it to you? Yeah, I mean, I would I would I wanted to make a memo for sure. Yeah. Um, and I think what I'm what I've been hearing is that we do support the general plan, right, to remove the median, to do the mini roundabouts, to do the sidewalk. And we're and also with the idea that it's being extended. Yeah. Right, that those we do support those projects as is. Um, does does anybody want to make a motion on that? We can send that to. Uh, I'll make a motion to support the project as is. Um, the sidewalks, the mini rotaries, and the extension next year. Okay, I can second that. Okay, so that we can vote. So um, I guess we'll take a roll call vote. And so, uh, so, uh, so let's say Chris. Yes. Okay. And I'll be a yes. Marcus. Yes. Okay. Stefan. Yes. And Joe, right, if you're here. Joe might not. Joe said he's also doing childcare at the same time. <laughs> so, okay. Um. We can put Joe down as an abstention. Yeah, we can put. Him yeah, that's what I was going to suggest. That's where we can we can put him as extension. And do we want to make any other recommendation? Um, Go ahead. Before you, Tracy, I, uh, George would like to say something. Oh, okay. Hi, George. Please speak. Did you unmute George? I did. It takes a little while. You know, signals going from my house and George's house, and I mean, George, you're welcome to come into the room too. Well, that's usually how I do it: is promote as a panelist. Yeah, that, that's fine with me. He's rejoining as a panelist. Excellent. Okay. 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 Here I am. Um, I just wanted to clarify that, uh, yes, we did not meet today. Um, it wasn't because of uh, the fact that you hadn't yet met. We realized that um, we needed your input. Mm -hmm. And so that was uh, something that we were looking forward to getting for our next meeting. Um, we had other issues that uh, led to canceling. Um, but uh, we appreciate you taking the time to do this. And um, we will have a challenge on the 30th. But um, we will be discussing speed limits. Uh, that is part of the agenda, but we will also take up Heatherstone Road um, is the plan. And now, so, is Hen Henry Street still on the agenda or is that going to uh, get? Not moved? to my knowledge. Uh, okay. I'm not the chair and I'm only the vice chair. But the last time I looked at the uh, the schedule that, that Andy had put out, um, it had to do with speed limits. Um, we're hoping that uh, someone from APD can be there. Um, we're hoping that the town engineer might be able to be there. Um, and that's going to be the main focus, but we would also take up Heatherstone Road. Um, Great. And, well, thank you. So that's that's all I want to say. But thank you. Thank you. No, I think that's great. I mean, one thing I've wondered a lot with speed limits and, you know, as we've, because at previous meetings too, we've talked about safe routes to school. It's just how much enforcement there is of speed limits. 
much. I mean, given that. George, um, I just want to let you know, George, as the vice chair, um, I'm going to go uh, work with the fifth grade at Fort River tomorrow, who's very interested in doing advocacy around um, safe biking for kids. And they definitely have the um, meeting on the 30th on their radar screen. So um, I would imagine that there might be some fifth graders showing up or writing a meet, you know, writing a letter and um, something along those lines. But I can just talk to you and Andy about that separately. But just so you know. Thank you. Thank you for that update. Okay, so we took the vote um, on the main project. Do we have any other kind of comments we want to add as well as the committee? I mean, I I personally think it's worth exploring the town, exploring, you know, chapter 90s, section 17C more, um, because I do think it can send a message about that, you know, this is a community that's interested in having lower speeds, um, even though, of course, as we've talked about, you know, the speed limits, the people don't actually drive a different speed unless you actually do things to the road and or do enforcement. Um, I also had brought up previously about the intersection with Pelham Road about how it's important, I think, to um, narrow. That's the section, Heather Stone, how it like widens out, it flanges out right there. And because part of your part of the memo for the project for this year talked about the crosswalk at um, on Pelham Road at Heather Stone, and that just the fact that between you know, as you're approaching from the south to, to Pelham Road, right, the road is, as we said, it's what, it's 24, 30 feet, and then, but it goes, it gets so much wider, like right before the intersection, um, which I think if people are going to use a crosswalk crossing that section of he um, Heatherstone, that it does, doesn't feel as safe if it's so wide. Um, and I also just had questions about with the um, setback, like if you made it less wide, you could have the stop line closer to the intersection. Um, and then also the sight lines are just are not that good. Like to looking to the left, for example, like with the hill and there's a bit of a curve and things. And it's it feels to me like it would be safer if it was narrower. And I don't know, I mean, I understand if that's not part of the current project, but that could be a suggestion. Um, because Gilfreda, were you going to do anything? You are going to do a crosswalk there, but are you going to do any kind of narrowing there or is that outside of the scope of this? We probably will narrow it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. The road is actually on some people's property in that, those two corners. So we, we'll probably try to narrow down some. That'd be great. I mean, it is like, it is significantly wider. Have you measured how much wider it is? It feels much It is, wider. but I think it has to do more with the fact how narrow um, Pelham Road is. And, uh -huh. um Pelham Road is really the the layout's a little narrow. The road is, I think the road is barely twenty feet wide in most of it. So it's, yeah, it's, it's something that it's something we talked about with the fifth graders is you got all this stuff you want to put in the road, but you only have so much space which belongs to you to put in the road. Right, right. That's why Pelham Road is going to be more of an issue. If you really want to do some improvements, you've got to start taking people's properties along Pelham Road. Not the whole property, but no, just understanding. I understand that. Um, and then I noticed too that there was like with those, the cross streets, like one of the, two of the streets have um, some kind of street light, but the other one doesn't. And one of the things that people, so with the, so you're proposing currently to do three mini roundabouts? Two to three. Two to three, okay. So I guess there's one of the streets, I th is it Alpine? I wrote it down, but I can't, I don't know where it, but one of those streets right now doesn't have a light there at all. And and some people have talked about how dark it is, including as you approach Pelham Road. Oh, actually th they all have lights. Oh, um, or maybe it's trees. I don't know. One fell over. So oh. there, there is accommodations for lights at every intersection. It's just one of them actually fell over. Oh, all right. So it's not there because we're out of poles. Oh, uh, got it. Okay. Um, yeah. 
And we could also just comment just about the importance of these other connections. You know, Chris, as you were saying, uh, Belchertown Road and things. Do we feel comfortable as a committee kind of adding those comments in too? Yeah, I mean, I would want the memo to sort of be strongly in support based on the pieces that we've talked about, the rotaries as the traffic calming and the sidewalks. Not about, the, yeah. You know, sorry, yeah. You keep talking <laughs> about that. And I'll keep screwing that up. But I don't mind other sort of recommendations or consider sure. considerations that we think, you know, could either be alternatives maybe on down the line or just, you know, where this, you know, what's um, uh, further extensions and connections with the other projects, mm -hmm. I, yeah. uh, you know. Well, I'll, um, when I write up the memo, I mean, I'll circulate it before I submit it for TSL's feedback. So um, I can look at a little of that. I mean, did uh, Stefan, Marcus, Joe, do you guys have any comment on those elements? No, we're good. We're nope. good. Okay, great. All right. So, um, all right, well, then I'll circulate it around and then we'll, we will submit it to TSO. Thanks, Tracy. So, um, yeah, we can thanks. also get Kim's feedback, which I'm sure will be helpful. She's a great editor. All right, so let's see, other items. And I know we're kind of getting close to the hour, so I'll try to keep it pretty short. Um, so there's this meeting on the 30th with TSO, you know, where they're supposed to talk about traffic calming, speed limits and so on. Um, I'm just including that as informational. Um, when I talked to the chair, he, he had said, you know, he would invite that TAC people could be invited to participate as panelists. Um, so I'll probably do so. And it sounds like, Chris, that you're planning to come and talk about some safe routes to school related. Well, I mean, I, or... I, it sounds, I'm going to be talking to fifth okay. grade. We're planning to come. <laughs> All right. So, so if George does have his hand up, I don't know if it would be a good time to just. Yeah, I don't know, George. Is George still? Yeah, just uh, delighted to hear the fifth graders are thinking of coming. Um, I right. just wanted to encourage that. Um, and if they could also send written comments um, and, and Christine certainly reach out to Andy, but that would be great. And um and I had submitted um some written comments related to some of the safe route school issues that have come up with school zones and so on already. So we'll make sure that we put we'll make sure that those are shared with the whole TSO. So thank you. Um the so yeah, other items were just this idea of the transportation commission. So our next meeting, if assuming we have a quorum, will be on May 30th. The town manager said that he would like to be on the agenda um to talk about the creation of a transportation commission i know that he's been working on the draft charge i had seen something i don't know probably like three or four or five months ago um and it was also being reviewed internally at town hall but so he'd like to bring that back to us and get our feedback and then bring it forward to the council so uh, so it's great to hear that that's moving forward and i don't have any other Big updates. Does anybody else have any updates? Well, I do have this one item that Stefan mentioned sort of last minute, but anything else? Nope. Okay. Nope. Okay. Um so Stefan brought up to my attention and and we I guess we could consider this under you know topics not reasonably anticipated. Um but before we do that, are, is that, is everyone who is here now, we have five of our six members here. Are people all available on the 30th for the next TSO meeting? Is that gonna work? Yeah. I'm blind without my phone. Um, is that a Thursday? Is that That's Thursday? a Thursday, it's two Thursdays from now. So it's the same, so the TSO is that The morning. TSO meets in the morning now. So mm -hmm. TSO meets at 10. It's a lot of transportation. I can, I can do that. Okay. Um, and I did contact the town manager yesterday just to confirm that he still wants to be on the agenda for 30th, but I haven't heard back from him. Um, so Stefan, Joe, Marcus, does that all work for you? Yeah, we're good. Okay, cool. All righty. Um, all right, so Stefan, let's bring up your the, the question that was raised to you. Sure. Um, I mean, yeah, let me just look at my email. I just actually lost it had three seconds ago. 
But, yeah, um, or if you even want to like put it up on your, you can share your screen or something if that's easiest. But um, sure, I can. Let me see here. Let me just log into my Gmail because I don't have the. Uh, or I can share it. Either way. Uh, actually, if you want to pull it up, Tracy, that might be easier. That's fine. Okay. Thank you. I was on my. I was uh, looking at my phone. Um, meetings on my computer. No, it's all good. Let's see. All right. But yeah, it was it was sent two weeks ago, and honestly, got buried in my inbox. And then oh, I no it to Tracy, and I didn't remember until tonight. Uh, okay, let me just. <clears throat> okay, let me. I'm just gonna pull up. Open a new tab. So, all right. I'm sharing my screen here. Okay. So, what this was is this is a um. So this was forwarded from Stefan right before this meeting this afternoon, and the person was asking for um. They had a question about the South Amherst roundabout. I think I want to do a little educational campaign about Rotary's roundabouts. Anyway. But um, about the one um, in South Amherst, and if they could, if there could be some signage about bikes having the full lane, which I think there is signage like that on, on the um, the one at Triangle in East Pleasant. Is that correct, Guilford? Yeah, that, there's supposed to be signage on this one too, but if it hasn't been put up yet, it just might be an oversight. Okay. Because this we we. We do the signage. The contractor doesn't usually do the signage. All right. So I'll have to check. I'll get the guys who work. On I'll that forward check. that to you. I'll forward it to you and Jason. You guys can just check check yeah. on it. And do you also do do you do pavement markings as well related to the bikes? We do some, not all of them, because the the really nice ones are done by a contractor, and then we just do set the minor ones. So what, how is it, like, if I was a bicyclist entering the roundabout, what is it, what, what is the pavement, what is the pavement marking that you use? We won't use a pavement marking for that. We we'll use the sign that says you're, you can use the whole line. We oh, okay. Okay. You just have the signage. Got it. Yep. We and so, would, and is that signage then on all like four approaches or just it is usually. Okay. Well, there you go. I th hopefully we can solve it pretty fast. Simple. Thank you. And have you gotten, just, I'm just curious, have you gotten much feedback about the South Amherst roundabout? Um, most people like it. There's a few people who hate it, but then they actually hate every roundabout in town and the one at Route 9 and 91 as well. So. Well, that um, one's pretty bad. <laughs> that one's pretty complicated. So, yeah. That one's a good one. I like that. That's a... yeah. The one at nine and ninety one is awesome. <laughs> it's just so com. I mean, the single lane I'll roundabouts say you compared complicated to double lane roundabout. roundabouts. <laughs> no, I mean I can understand. Like, I mean, I volunteer sometime with um Amherst neighbors, and they have people who are like afraid to drive like through that. And in terms of safety, particularly bicycle and pedestrian safety, I mean it's pretty obvious the safety benefits about single yeah. lane roundabouts because but like the so larger much. roundabouts are a lot more complicated and yes you don't have as many you know fatalities of them as you do at like four-way intersections but um but i can understand why people are intimidated by them so. but at the same time that's a good thing right because it slows yeah. you down i mean that's kind of half the half the thing about it is it gets you going slow whether it's because you're scared witless or you're just trying to be careful it but also happen. sometimes people like i was at the one on 90 the route 9 91 one actually i was getting off 91 there northbound yeah. and i was going down the exit ramp and there was somebody who got turned around on the roundabout and they were coming up the exit ramp and yeah. that was like right after they had redesigned it and they didn't have sufficient signage to say please don't go up the wrong way on to 91 and uh i contacted district two right away and after a while they put up more signage but um but that was pretty scary i mean people really don't always know what's going I mean, on but they do, yeah they do that at a, they do that at a so. at a normal you know on ramp too so it's no, not it's not it's not rotary related yeah i think it is a little but anyway anyway so um yeah okay i'm gonna leave now
No, I that's great. Okay, thank you. Thank you for being seven. here. And I think we're we're done, right? We're done for now. Yeah, I think so. And um okay. Oh. All right, thank you all. Yep. All thank right, you bye guys. Bye. Thank you. bye.